So allow me to introduce our next um, speaker, Domen Marincic, uh, a musician, a musicologist um, who deals um, especially with topics concerning performing practice. Um, and today he's going to present us his paper entitled Tartini's Music Performed Without Corda Continua. Okay, Domen, please. Many thanks. I'll just share um, my screen, just a moment. I hope it works. So my approach to Tartini's music as a performer, both on keyboard and string instruments, has undergone several stages of transformation. Twelve years ago, I was involved in a CD recording featuring uh, four of Tartini's violin sonatas. We employed a bass viol and harpsichord for accompaniment, simply because the viol has long been my main instrument. For concerts, however, I soon exchanged the viol for the cello, one obvious reason being the importance of Tartini's friend and colleague, the cellist Antonio Vandini. After a while, I changed the bow grip to underhand instead, instead of the more usual overhand and started using my viol bow on the cello. It soon became obvious that most cellists, including Vandini, held the bow at the frog rather than further up the stick like most viol players do. So this meant that I had to get a different bow. Another change, and this is already the fourth one, happened about three years ago when I started changing the bowing direction. I discovered that Quance's description of Italian cellists using down bows for the principal notes has hitherto been misinterpreted and that it actually applies to the underhand bow grip. Here's a picture of a cellist using down bows, uh, no, uh, bowing underhand from Quan's Versuch of 1752. Um, I hope the picture is, is big enough. He holds the bow just like Vandini, whom you saw before that. So uh, Quantz writes that down bows produce a better effect, particularly in accompanying, since the principal notes receive more strength and emphasis than the passing ones. So another in element that has been concerning me since many years is the presence or absence of chordal instruments in Tartini's music. And this is the topic of my talk today. In a paper read seven years ago, I already expressed doubt whether Tartini normally expected a harpsichord or organ to participate in many of his works. This seems much more a, a radical idea as Sergio Durante described it yesterday, since uh, it can have a greater effect on the audible result than details of playing technique that I have just described. Widespread designations such as violone o cimbalo or violoncello or cembalo seem to be taken more seriously since David Watkins' article of 1996, which argues for accompanying Corelli's violin sonatas by cello only. Despite the fact, however, that this article also mentions Tartini and cites an example from his music, this has not been taken much further until five years ago when David Plantier and Annabelle Luis started performing and recording as a duo of violin and cello. They very often they play Tartini's music. So the designation violoncello or cimbalo is also found in several of Tartini's collection published in Amsterdam, Paris in, and London. This is of course not the only designation found in sources of his music. On this list uh, that you are just seeing, I have collected some of the descriptions found in various manuscripts, prints, and also letters. I haven't yet classified them according to quick frequency or their proximity to Tartini, since I haven't yet been able to evaluate all the surviving sources, but such an undertaking is planned in the near future. Nevertheless, I can point out that the neutral description basso seems to be the most common. Basso continuo, on the other hand, is rather rare, and I would propose to generally avoid sub substituting the simple basso for basso continuo in editions and writing, since today the latter, so uh, basso continuo, strongly implies chordal realization. It's important to observe that only two of these uh, 15 designations, 
those marked in bold letters explicitly demand, demand a keyboard instrument. In all those marked in red, and there are seven of them, the principal option seems to be one bowed instrument or more without organ or harpsichord. But to be sure, this is not meant to exclude keyboard instruments from all performances of any of Tartini's works. Tartini does mention the harpsichord, organ, and even the lute in his letters. Uh, Tommaso Luison tells me that in a document in 1753, the first organist at St. Anthony was required to participate in performances of instrumental music. There's also some testimony of the presence of harpsichords referring to their maintenance, but the question remains when these instruments were actually employed. There is puzzlingly little evidence of the presence of keyboard instruments in the surviving parts for Tertini concertos in Padua. Only six out of 70 sets of parts include one that appears to be intended for a keyboard instrument. Furthermore, in three of these six cases, the figures were added at a later stage. Some parts may have been lost or the organist may have used the score, but one should bear in mind that two carefully figured organ parts survive for some of Valotti's music in the same archive, together with those for cello and double bass. In a letter to Algarotti from 1750, Tatini implies that a single cello accompaniment must have, must have been at least at some stage in his career, one of the expected options for solo sonatas. He seems to refer to a string bass instrument when using the word bassetto, a term that is also used for traditional string basses in Istria. So this text says, my little violin sonatas have the bass for the sake of tradition. I play them without the bassetto, and this is my true intention. Such a practice was not confined to Italy. Sébastien de Brossard is, explains in his dictionary of 173 that the basso continuo is often played simply and without figures, sans chiffre, meaning without chords, on the bass viol, bass violin, bassoon, or serpent. Matheson writes in 1713 that the French often use a bass violin for accompaniment without a keyboard instrument. More than half a century later, John Jacques Rousseau described that the violin solo is accompanied by cello or harpsichord avec un simple accompagnement de basse ou de clavecin. Here are some violinists who are known at a certain occasion or over a long period of time to have performed in a duo accompanied by cellists only. All are Italian except for Benda whose violin solo was accompanied by Pisendel on the viola pomposa, according to Hiller. Um, these are all male professional virtuoso performers. We should therefore consider the possibility that the harpsichord accompaniment mentioned as an alternative to the cello in so many prints may have partly fulfilled a social function, perhaps, uh, perhaps envisioning a lady at the harpsichord as Michael Talbot had suggested after a paper I gave, I gave years ago. This brings me to back to Quantz, who writes that in general, the cellist must strive to draw a full, round and virile tone from his instrument. Sound quality is only one of the main, many elements that we must consider when trying to understand the aesthetic of performing Tartini or similar repertoires without chordal continuo. I will now try to suggest some context for such practices by first attempting a short overview of repertoires that would have been performed in this way. I will discuss the implications of the presence of absence and figures and some of the elements that may have played a role for performance, such as dynamics, articulation, improvisation, tuning, and various forms of flexibility that designations such as violone over spinetta were indeed intended as alternatives is already confirmed by Giovanni Maria Bononcini, who in a preface to a collection of 1671 mentions that the violone will make a better effect since his bass lines are more appropriate to the one than to the other. So this is one example and here's one, another example from this collection. The first one featured slurs, and this one has frequent tempo changes and one dynamic markings. All these elements seems to play a role in the choice of instruments. 
Eight years later, Arcangelo Corelli writes in a letter to Count Laderchi that once the Count has ascertained that a sonata that Corelli has composed for violin and lute works well on those instruments, he may also like to try it on the violin and the violone, for it may make, it may make uh, a very good effect. Composers of sonatas explicitly destined for violin and cello include Torelli, Bartolomeo Laurenti, Pegolotti, Platti, Tessarini, Nardini, Cirri, Anfossi and Giordani, to name just a few. Some of the earlier ones, starting with Cazzati in 1662, have appeared in Bologna, and I should mention the Sonate per Camera a Violino e Violoncello di Vari Autori, published there in 1700, which include works by Corelli, Torelli, Iacchini, and many others. An interesting case is Antonio Vivaldi's collection of violin sonatas, Opus II, uh, published in Venice in 1709, which was at first announced as being for violin and cello, but was finally published under the title Sonate a Violino e Basso per il Cembalo. Uh, some of these duos have more active bass lines, featuring many double quavers and partly competing with the violin. Um, here you see an example by uh, Laurenti from 1791. Uh, furthermore, especially the later duos offer valuable evidence for the use of chords or double stops. Three and four bar chords are mostly uh, employed for opening or closing gestures, while double stops are usually limited to occasional isolated, isolated pace, passages of parallel thirds or sixths, especially in slow movements. This is a movement uh, from a cello sonata by Luigi Boccherini featuring double stops for the accompanying cello. For comparison, here is an excerpt from Tartini's sonata opus two, numbers three. These double stops uh, all lie very well on the cello. And while the publisher left the bass part unfigured at this point, it seemed unlikely that similar double stops were expected uh, to be added systematically in this movement. You can see the double stops uh, at the end of the, in the three bars, uh, three or four bars at the end of the second system there. Yeah. Um, so such double stops are occasionally found elsewhere in Tartini's violin sonatas, and they can be interpreted in different ways. They make the presence of another instrument such as the harpsichord unlikely, but do not automatically preclude it if we think of Geminiani's variation examples, where a separate line is sometimes given for the harpsichord together with chordal passages for the cello. Gimignani's examples in his art of playing the guitar seem to come closest to an elusive continual editorization on the cello. This is somewhat of an exception, however, and there is little evidence that cellists in this period were normally expected to systematically realize bass lines accordingly. Such continualization on the cello has been the focus of many recent articles and theses, but the authors have to draw largely on late 18th century treatises discussing recitative accompaniment, uh, also on earlier sources documented chordal accompaniment on the bass viol, or on repertoire for the cholo, solo cello ascending even to Bach suites. Uh, the instructions by Jean Baumgartner, published in The Hague in 1774, show simple harmonizations for the cello, but the accompanying text suggests to apply such techniques in recitative, in symphonies, or in other richly scored music, provided they lie very well under the hand. The author also points out that it would be very inappropriate to add ornament scales or other additions in chamber music in solos, duos, trios, or, or quartets. Other 18th century repertoires without chordal continuo include Italian chamber sonatas and trios, sonate a quattro, overtures, and dance music in both French and English opera, various duos and music for one solo instrument. We should bear in mind that Corelli's Concerti Grossi can be performed as string trios. According to the original title page, everything else is at libitum. In 1733, Georg Philipp Telemann uh, published quartets for two flutes or violins and two bassoons or cellos. He writes the second bassoon part can either be left out or played on the harpsichord. This is also the reason that it is figured 
it may come as a shock to some that Telemann's well-known Paris quartets seem to have been originally performed without harpsichord, just with flute, violin, bass, viol, and cello. In a manuscript of Telemann's F major recorder concerto copied by Graupner, the accompaniment of solo section is, so sections is left to the cello alone. This corresponds to the practice seen in manuscript parts of Tartini's concertos in the collection of Charles Jennings. Uh, the violone or, or violone or cembalo part is figured, but it drops out in almost all, all solo sections, leaving them to the violoncello obbligato. Um, the presence or absence of figures is sometimes difficult to interpret. Here is a fully figured autograph of, of one of Tartini's violin sonatas, but this is a great exception. It seems that Tartini normally left his solo sonatas, trios, and concertos unfigured, and that figured were only added, uh, added for publication. This didn't always happen. His collection of sonatas a violino e basso, opus 2, which was published unfigured in both its, its Roman and its Parisian edition. So does the presence of figures mean that the keyboard instrument is necessary or that the harmonies have to be realized on the cello? I have already mentioned Telemann's quartets. Uh, he figures the second bass part simply for the case that some will, would, some, some will want to use a harpsichord instead of the bassoon. Similarly, Boismortier adds figures to the lowest flute part of his concertos for five flutes with the comment that one can also perform them with bass accompaniment. Guillemont figures his quartets Opus 12 from 1743 with the comment that if one wants to use the harpsichord, one should only accompany on the upper manual and play the chords unarpeggiated after the Italian manner. Similarly, the absence of figures is often dismissed as a possible indicator for the absence of chordal instruments, but everything depends on the context. The Atoms collection of music manuscripts from Slovenska Bistrica, now in Maribor, features four Italian sonatas for flute and cello. They consist of two separate parts. The bass is unfigured and labeled violoncello, leaving no doubts as to the intended scoring. A manuscript from 1692 in the National University Library in Ljubljana features one of Corelli's chamber trios Opus 2, while the bass line in the original print is figured and labeled violone or cimbalo, figures have deliberately been left out by the copyist, apparently envisioning a performance without any kind of continual realization. At the end, I will now quickly mention some of the elements that may have been important when performing music without chordal continuo. Articulation was certainly of central importance to Tartini. He was, of course, much concerned with the use of the bow. And I, was also, I would also refer to Tartini's poetic mottos presented yesterday beautifully by Tommaso Luison. I'm sure that they, they must also influence and inspire articulation in those cases where they are underlaid under the music. Articulation was also important to bass players. Charles Burney writes that he wanted much to hear the famous old Antonio Vandini on the violoncello, who the Italians say, plays and expresses a parlare that is in such a manner than to make that as to make his instrument speak. The method of the Paris Conservatory, published in 1804 by Bayot and others, points out that the cellist must distinguish between accompanying parts and parts where the instrument takes part in the musical discourse. Uh, the method cites a grave by Tartini and changes quavers uh, to semiquavers with rests, as well as another movement where the notes should be slurred and connected. This corresponds very well to the description in Tartini's Regole per arrivare a saper ben suonare il violino, where he distinguishes between the cantabile, where the notes are joined without any gaps, and the suonabile, associated with leaps in the line, where there is some detachment between the notes. Tartini often notates rests in his bass parts with astounding care. Here's an example of this. Um, 
I would also mention Johann Friedrich Daube, who in 1773 prints an example for a trio and points out that the cello is more appropriate for the bass line since it can reproduce the articulation, bowings, slurs, and the so-called forzando, things that a keyboard cannot do. There are many more elements that can contribute to our appreciation and understanding of uh, performing the tennis music without call continuo. They include dynamics, uh, flexibility in dynamic shading, flexibility in tempo and tuning, as well as acoustical and practical consideration. Uh, considerations including transport and tuning of instruments. As uh, temperament was discussed this morning, I would just mention that Valotti points out that Tartini liked, liked to tune his uh, violins in pure fifths. Thank you very much. My profound apologies to Doman and to the rest of the conference for arriving late this morning. Um, we have just heard a masterly summary of the evidence for different kinds of basso continuo realization. Um, and uh, I think I seldom heard such a complete and logical uh, conclusion However, I, I wonder if we, uh, Doman, want to uh, turn that upside down and say that what you showed is not necessarily that composers had a set way in mind for performing a given piece, except as you correctly said, in a given context. And that context, is it involves personnel, uh, level of technique, uh, type of instruments, local traditions, acoustics of the venue, and um, that in many respects, it was a deliberate attempt to give a skeleton that could be used under almost any condition whatsoever. It's interesting that, as you mentioned, it's now accepted that Corelli's instructions for violone u cembalo uh, really were correct. Um, and therefore, um, the idea that we could set something rather than saying, make this music work in your circumstances. Um, would you like to, <laughs> uh, show me that you already came to that conclusion. Or yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I, I also think that, of course, uh, performances must have varied largely, and I find it very difficult to um, uh, point to specific pieces that would have been performed in this or a different way, as, as I, I try to show it's difficult to interpret the presence or absence of figures, for example, that that this music hasn't been performed, even the, the absence of uh, performance material that could have been used for, um, for on the keyboard instrument is, is, um, is also, of course, I mean, some, some material can, could have been, been, been lost, people could have improvised in, in different ways. And this is, of course, not to fix um, one uh, performance. I have concentrated on, on this uh, possibility since it uh, seems to be so rarely explored today. But um, of course, I'm under the impression that, that uh, people, I, th I think people should, um, should slightly get rid of the impression that any uh, Baroque repertoire should necessarily include um, Caudal Continuo. And also that there are some aesthetic considerations that might um, contribute to our understanding and also appreciation of, of this music as both as performers, listeners or researchers. <laughs>
Yes, yes, I, I agree in, entirely. Um, I will point out that there is another type of evidence which you uh, looked at um, that perhaps has other implications. Um, uh, there's a document I like very much of a famous Italian cellist by Orologio, who was the continual player in St. Petersburg and um, was famous for accompanying all the rest of the teams. And when he left to go back to Italy, uh, the opera company went through a crisis and had quite a hard time uh, performing uh, for a while until they uh, changed their arrangements. Um, and, uh, and then Brossard, by the way, um, his is not a dictionary about French music, it's a dictionary about Italian music. Yes, exactly, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, which is an interesting thing. Um, I have one, one more thing that I might add, which is that the further north you go, the more figures you find in the manuscripts and the, uh, the prints. And so you could say that it, it was a native style in uh, Italy and north of the Alps, it had to be explained a little bit more. Oh yes, that's possible. Yes, I. Um, well, there is this uh, opinion that that these uh, pieces were often uh, figured incorrectly. That uh, an Italian wouldn't have played this, the harmonies as they were played in 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 the north. And this is also, of course, an interesting option. And I would actually, when I refer to French practices, of course, some of these editions of of Tartini's music are. Uh, French editions and of course we can expect people to have employed the practices that they, 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 they knew best. So I think they're relevant. I wouldn't only concentrate on Padua and, and so on. And for, for example, yesterday uh, in yesterday's online concert, we um, also we did include the, the harpsichord. There was a concerto from Uppsala where actually the designation is violoncello or cembalo. Uh, no, yes. I think Cembalo comes first. That's the point. Yeah, that's the point. Uh -huh. I, but I, I wanted to play in that, of course. <laughs> also. Right. Uh, there is also a visual evidence of cello, cellists and double bass players looking over the shoulders of continual players. Um, so the number of parts doesn't necessarily uh, determine the number of players, as, as you very well, uh, very well know. Um, Questions, comments. Um, I would like to make a comment, but my camera is not working. Can you hear me? We yes. can. Okay. Um, well, uh, yesterday I gave a paper about 18th century violin sonatas in Madrid, and it's uh, we find exactly the same situations that you have just described. Uh, in most cases the scarce uh, sources we have from performance practice point at the cello as the normal instrument rather than the harpsichord or fortepiano. Yes, yes, I was, I'm so sorry that I couldn't hear your paper. I hope it's somewhere online because, it <laughs> yes, I, I, I will have to, to watch it um, today. I'm, I'm, I would like to say con congratulations to you. And I, I have found so many similar things uh, compared to the Spanish sources. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, it would be great if we could stay in contact. Um, yeah, sure. OK. Other questions or comments? Those of you who um, were trained as pianists know that if you go on tour, you don't have the luxury of taking your instrument with you. Um, and therefore, um, we assume that the players of orchestral instruments always have their own instruments and therefore have things under control. Um, but as somebody who uh, in his misspent youth was a touring musician, I have to say that um, each time you arrive in a new venue, uh, 
you have to change things. And even the musicians union has something called a sound check, which doesn't get paid extra, which is amazing. And um, in that you arrive in the hall early and you play a little bit and then you discover it sounds lousy and you start adjusting. Um, and I, I just think these were very, very um, practical decisions. Um, I mean, uh, look at the way somebody like Bach changed a piece, every a movement, every time he reused it. It had to, uh, I, I think our philosophy was still stuck with the conservatory mentality, which is that you go into the practice room and you just keep playing it until you can somehow make it come out of your instrument, rather than their idea, which was that they were going to adjust the music to fit the circumstances. Nobody wants to argue with me. Yeah, I, 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 I can say that uh, it, it's true. Uh, you, you have uh, different instruments and so you have to put yourself on the different instrument and uh, uh, the, the way it sounds, it's really different in, in, the, um, in the dialogue with the other instruments. So uh, it's it's true. <laughs> it's only true. And uh, and Kvantz, who was quoted earlier, um, has this wonderful passage of advice, saying, um, "If you have just been playing dance music, and suddenly the king uh, sends a courier saying you must come immediately for a church service." and you don't have any sacred music in, your, in what you're carrying, just slow it down, take the ornaments off, and change the continuo from harpsichord. Oh, well, not in dance music, it's not harpsichord, you know, and the think in terms of organ, and vice versa. If you're coming out of church and you're suddenly, you get a gig to go dance, dance band, uh, reverse that process. Play fast, play lots of ornaments. Yes, this is an important distinction that I haven't uh, mentioned because uh, Tartini doesn't have um, many dance movements, but of course um, it, it's very clear where uh, the practice of not having a keyboard instrument for dance music comes from. It's much more flexible. The, the band can just come in and play. They have tuned outside perhaps and they can disappear very quickly. They don't need a half an hour to tune the harpsichord and so on, yes. Yes. And of course, at least in the Austrian realm, that, that I don't know whether this is true for Italy, because I haven't studied Italian dance music, but no viola part and um, uh, a 16 foot bass preferred over the eight foot bass, usually no cello. Well, yes, I also know this from, from Austrian music, but not from yes. Italy, yes. Yes, Austrian music, but not Italy. Not that I, yeah. I know. I mean, I, I, I think when, when always when one, one looks for, for evidence, there is always something. But, but yes. I, I don't know it now. <laughs> well, of course, in the in the opera house, the ballets were uh, descended from French models, and so that's string ensemble. Yes. But that must be different from uh, secular ballroom music. Um, how do you mean that uh, the opera dances were, were different from? Well, Sorry. well, in at least um, uh, the first two thirds of the 18th century, often there was a, uh, a leader for, for the uh, dance music who was different from the leader for the vocal music. Yes, of course. And, yeah. And um, would be led from the violin rather than from a continual instrument. Yeah. And, and was based on a, you know, Lully Rameau uh, type of orchestration as opposed to an Italian orchestration. Yes, it's or some hybrid. 
Yes, I had mentioned this in, in passing where when you know I was trying to list uh, a few examples of, of music performed without without choral continuo and and opera overtures and and dances uh, are falling in this into this. I, I see that we're now uh, exactly 10 minutes behind schedule, which means we're on the same schedule that I arrived on and we probably should thank uh, Doman for a wonderful presentation and my renewed apologies and uh, move on to our second paper. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker, Louisa Anthony, is going to speak to us about Tartini's violin sonatas in um, collections that were published uh, in the early 20th century. Um, please, Louisa, begin. You're muted. Um, somebody has to unmute. We cannot hear you. Louisa, can you hear me? You have to unmute your Zoom. Unmute. Okay. Ah. Okay. Yeah. There we yeah. Go. Here we Thank are. You. And now I try to share the screen. Oh, are you see my screen or not? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. What is? Uh, I put share screen. Okay. Now you should see your own. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay, here we are. And now you are looking to my screen? Yes. Okay, and uh, here. Good. Okay. Uh, my paper. Excuse me, Louisa, yeah. go down to the lower right hand corner and click on full screen. Full screen. It's a little symbol of a square with arrows pointing out. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Further, further down to the to the lower right. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so uh, my paper will deal with the history of Italian music of the 20th century and with the history of a reception. Uh, this is now the part of the history of Italian music. In Italy, especially in 19th century, opera absorbed almost all creative powers and was musically predominant. We are speaking about names such as Bellini, Donizetti, Mascagni, Puccini, Verdi, before Rossini. Opera halted the development of instrumental music on the one hand and on the other did not allow, did not allow the ground of music, the development of the contemporary musical languages. The generation commonly referred as the Generazione degli anni Ottanta, generation of the 80s, Franco Alfano, Ottorino Respighi, Ildebrando Pizzetti, Gianfrancesco Malipiero and Alfredo Casella began to look for alternative ways to stimulate Italian music to be at the same time at the level as Austrian, German and French in the dimension of the instrumental music. Secondly, to encourage the development of new, more contemporary musical languages. One of these starting points was a look back to early music in the period when Italy was really in advanced positions, so to the period of Renaissance and Baroque. If we look in more detail, we will find that at that time in the early 20th century took place in Italy a diffuse current for the discovery of masters of early music. This looking back inspired the composers of the 20th century. We are talking about composers such as Respighi, Malipiero, Della Piccola. They looked with interest at their distant ancestors and started to explore new paths. For example, Ottorino Respighi composed three suites of antiche arie e danze per liuto. 
1931 and posthumous in 1937. Luigi della Piccola wrote to Tartignane. This is the subject of my essay, which I presented at the symposium Tartini Maestro delle Nazioni held in Piran in 2001. In my paper, I analytically reconstructed the word, work made by Della Piccola with the two Tartinis sonatas he chose for his two Tartinianas. The sonatas was Sonata D, 12th for the first Tartiniana and Sonata A, 1 for the second Tartiniana. To Gianfrancesco Malipiero, we, we owe a huge amount of work, mainly transcriptions of Claudio Monteverdi, Antonio Vivaldi, Benedetto Marcello, Giovanni Battista Bassani, Emilio De Cavalieri, Niccolò Iomelli, Baldassare Galuppi, and Tartini is one of them. Now we are going to the part of the reception. After his death, Tartini was slowly forgotten, such as other composers, not last among them Johann Sebastian Bach. We remember the great work made by Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi in the 1829 with the first presentation in modern times of the St. Matthew's Passion, which started Bach Renaissance. We don't have still today a similar Tartini Renaissance. We can say that we are still waiting for. Now here, I would like to present a particular uh, way of review. Two different collections that were created at the beginning of the 20th century in the Italian speaking area. The first before and the second after the first world war. I said Italian speaking area because the first publication was not in Italy. Trieste, till the end of the First War, was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the first collection appeared in Trieste. In uh, 1911, Emilio Pente and Maffeo Zanon edited for the Trieste publishing house Schmidl and Company a collection entitled New Collection of Eleven Sonatas. A with the accompaniment of pianoforte. The history of the Schmidl publishing house uh, dates back uh, to uh, 1813, when Domenico Dalmaschio called Vicentini took care of the needs of the theater, scores and music material, and began a successful printing business. In addition, the store has become a reference point for the whole of Primorska, the littoral, from Gorizia to Istrian towns. In 1889, Vicentini sold the store to Carlo Schmidl, and he, for the new prints, adopted the new serial numbers. In 1891, Schmidl bought the founder of the Bologna publisher, Luigi Trelby, who already had uh, 2,154 issues in the catalog. And Schmidl decided started his catalogation from Trelby's catalog number. The publisher, Carlo Schmidl, opened a new store in Cologne, Köln, in 1898. In 1901, he agreed with the Milan publisher, Ricordi, and offered him almost all his catalog. In return, he became the representative for the Ricordi branch in Leipzig, where he later founded his own agency called Schmidl and Company. Publishing activity of Schmidl is very di diversified and diverse, from numerous salon composition, this is one of them, to opera librettos. In addition, according with the times, he also began the raccolta di tesori musicali d'Italia, assisted by the violinist Cesare Barison, who researched through the archives in Bologna, Modena, Ferrara, and of course in Venice. He was looking mainly for instrumental sonatas and early music. In 1913, Schmidl marked the uh, 100th anniversary of his Trieste publishing house with a special publication. This is the publication. Today, 
the Trieste Theater Museum is named after him. His legacy beca beca became the first brick on which the theater museum was later founded. Eight years later, in 1919, three volumes with a total of eight Tartini sonatas were published in the collection I Classici della Musica Italiana, Raccolta Nazionale, diretta da Gabriele D'Annunzio. The collection I Classici della Musica Italiana was led by D'Annunzio with several collaborators. Ildebrando Pizzetti, Francesco Balilla Pratella and Malipiero Hips, his, himself, and Carlo Perinello, who taught composition from 1904 to 1914 at the conservatory in Trieste, and then at the beginning of the fifth world, moved to Milano and became professor at the local conservatory. D'Annunzio and Malipiero have known each other since 1916 when D'Annunzio visited Venezia. After the reconstruction of La Rassonia Uras, it was Malipiero who invited D'Annunzio to lead the collection I Classici della Musica Italiana. In total, this collection comprises 3307 volumes arranged in 36 books in alphabetical order from Adriano Banchieri to Domenico Zipoli. The uh, 32nd volume is dedicated to Giuseppe Tartini and contains eight violin sonatas. This is the, the containing. In the presentation, Malipiero wrote that Tartini's eight sonatas for violin, uh, volumes uh, 131 and 136, belong to the manuscript of the Marciana Library. According to Pinamonti, both collections relied in the manuscript ET 4, 475, kept by the Marciana Library in Venice and belonging to the found of Girolamo Contarini. The comparison between the two manus the, this manuscript and the two printed editions reinforced precisely this hypothesis. This, here we have the two um, comparison. We have Brainerd uh, catalogation, then the Pente edition, Malipiero edition, and in the in the middle, the new um, new edition uh, we have now online. And then we have the manuscript of Marciana. Uh, at the last uh, column, we have the manuscript of Berlino, and I will explain why. Uh, it's quite clear that not only Balipiero, but also Pente drew from the Marchand manuscript. For example, Pente's second sonata consists of two Tartini sonatas, G15 and G16, one after another. Probably such a de decision was prompted by the fact that in the manuscript of the Marciana, after the word fine at the end of G15, continues with G16. And G16 has an andante cantabile ma non largo with variation, ending with a giga allegro non presto. Non presto. Pente decided to put together the two last movements with the previous uh, sonatas, uh, and they, they, these two movements and the manuscript of the Marciana. One, uh, on the useful advice of the musicologist Guido, Guido Viverit, I also checked the manuscript which is kept in Berlino. But here, not all published sonatas are available, as you can see. Viverit, who compiled a wonderful catalog of Tartini's work, also happened, helped me with detective research on the Minuetto Variato, which Schmidl included in his collection. So here we have uh, a part, uh, print screen of the uh, Viverit uh, description, uh, Viverit Incipits, and here we have the um, Pente uh, Schmidl uh, publication, and we can see that they are uh, mostly the same. 
Uh, I took only some uh, variations. Uh, here we have uh, uh, 18 variations. I will spend some words about the free new online thematic catalog of the compositions by Giuseppe Tartini, which is, which is really very well organized and absolutely useful for the musicians and the researchers. Here we can find the incipits of the movements, the bibliography and the information about the manuscript where the sonata or concert is. We also have a new numbering following uh, the work uh, that Margarita Canale has already done for he, her PhD thesis, uses the abbreviation, abbreviation GT, Giuseppe Tartini, followed by numbers and letters by tonality, similar to Breinart catalog. Now, uh, take back to the minuetto variato. Uh, this, for this minuetto, as we can see, Schmidl wrote that he thanked Principe Alberto Giovannelli, the owner of the original manuscript. The minuetto manuscript is kept in the library of the Brussels Royal Conservatory, and we discovered this with Guido Viverit. The minuet is in the violin version and also in the cello transcriptions, transcription prepared by Gilberto Crepas uh, or Crepax. Gilberto Crepax was born in Venice in 1890 and died in Milan in 1980. He met Toscanini, Alfredo Casella and Gianfrancesco Malipiero. In 1921, Toscanini invited him to join the Orchestra della Scala, which was then going on tour, important tour in the United States. So we don't know if Crepax prepared the transcription for Schmiedel, or more probably the transcription was a part of the manuscript of Alberto, Prince Alberto Giovannelli. Let's now look at who Emilio Pente and Matteo Zanon are. In the 1908, Emilio Pente collaborated with Schmidl on the printing of three of Tartini sonatas and a pastorale. Emilio Pente was born in Padua in 1869 and died in Germany in 1929. In Padua, uh, where he moved after studying in Milan, he founded a music newspaper and at the same time began researching Tartini's legacy. He discovered 40 manuscripts that had disappeared from the chapel of Sant'Antonio. He arranged this, this manuscript for printing for various German publishing houses. His Tartini concerts became very popular and in 1904, he performed in, on tours in Italy, Austria and Germany. His, he first performed in London in 1905 and his success was so resounded that in 1909, he became professor at the Guide Hall School of Music in London. Matteo Zanon was a composer and organist, born in Venice in 1882, and Herr also died in 1968. In 1912, he moved to Milan, where he became the main archivist of the Ricordi Publishing House and edited Ricordi's edition. We can say that Carlo Schmidl chose interesting interlocutors. Pente was therefore one of the most important violinists and researchers of Tartini's legacy. And Matteo Zanon, after his first experience with Schmidl, traveled to Milan and began collaborating with the most important Italian publisher. If Pente was strongly linked with the Austro-German world, Zanon was more linked with Italy. The sonatas of this collection, Schmidl collection, have the numbers 4,812 and 4,822. The minuet otherwise has the double numbering 4,000, 
5,823 and 5,466, which uh, means uh, that the first catalog number is for the violin version and the second for the violoncello transcription made by Cretax. Now, if we want to take a look to the realization of the basso continuo, it shows in the comparison of the both collection that Zanon opted for a harmonically cordially richer performance. In his realization, the harmony is too rich with a lot of septims, and sometimes he tries to introduce an imitation with the violin in the piano part, which perhaps can disturb. This is uh, one, and this is another uh, movement. Octaves appear several times in the left hand, and this is undoubtedly far from the musical aesthetic of 13th times. Balipiero realization is more rigorous and purer, placing, placing two more voices, not three as the non, above the bass line. I thought Malipiero realization is now obsolete. It shows the sensitivity of a true artist and the attempt to get closer to the Tartini's poetic. To conclude, however, I would only hint in the part that could be taken by a continuist who would embark on the realization of Tartini's basso continuo today. We know that Tartini has repeatedly opted for a violin and cello duo, as, as we heard. Uh, his uh, deep friendship with cellist Antonio Baldini is, is well known. We can think that he pre preferred to have an instrument with the, an adjustable pitch, as violoncello could be. Uh, we spoke also yesterday. But we can't ignore that the polyphonic instruments like harpsichord, organ, fortepiano, harp, and lute are justifiably part of this world. Anyone who plays these early instruments uh, today knows that basso continuo is mainly improvisation. But uh, he or her also, she uh, also knows that it's guided and according to the continuist operating today. The most correct and closest to the Tartini word is the, the treatise L'armonico pratico al cimbalo by Francesco Gasparini, wrote in 703. And that's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, comments? Louisa, would you unshare your screen? Oh yeah, if I can, I try. Yes. Okay. It's okay, yeah. Yes, now everybody can see everybody. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll uh, break the ice with a, a, a question. Um, you just described the continual realizations of Mount Piero and his generation um, as obsolete, more so than 18th century editions or they're obsolete also, aren't they? Uh, I don't understand, excuse me, the, oh. the question. Forgive me. You, you called the realizations that you just showed us from the early 20th century obsolete. Yeah. In what sense? In sense that uh, today the continuist uh, make uh, 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 in improvisation more um, the, the harpsichord or organ player. So it's uh, really uh, difficult uh, to play uh, this kind of realization on uh, with, with today um, uh, interpreters, today violinists. Yes, okay, absolutely. But what if 
uh, someone were playing on a Steinway or other modern piano and not with a Baroque violin and with a tort bow, yeah. would, would that then become obsolete? Uh, this is, um, as you play today, the Neupert uh, harpsichord. <laughs> the Neupert harpsichord is the kind of harpsichord, not a philological harpsichord. So you can play. It's, it's uh, um, uh, absolutely, um, uh, how to say, um, you can do this. It's a part of history, but it's yes. not a part of early history. It's a part yes. of our uh, later history. Yes, my, my point, which is that there, there is no such thing as inauthentic editions. Oh, there, yeah, yeah, obviously, yes. Right, that each one represents human thought and, and uh, love of something. Um, Neuferts are not around much anymore, fortunately or unfortunately, but it was published for pianoforte, not, not for harpsichord. And it is possible to regard it as a, what to say, late romantic view of Tartini that may be very beautiful if taken seriously. Yeah, uh, but yeah. We, we have to know that this is late romantic and not early music. Yes, good. I, we are on the same page, we agree. Um, others, it's Sergio. You're muted, Sergio. We need to hear you. I was just, uh, uh, you know, agreeing essentially. I have nothing, nothing to add. Although uh, I should also say that uh, if we listen to stuff which is on YouTube, uh, on uh, you know, uh, about Tartini, especially, but all sorts of things. Uh, there is a, a whole gallery of uh, horrible things uh, that have nothing to do with the either, uh, you know, early music and not uh, late romanticism. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to call that. But in any case, that's also part of our history, which means that the history is not always very good. Hey, Gustavus. <laughs> Thank you. Other reactions, comments? That being the case, I want to thank Louisa for her very thank clear you. and interesting presentation. And we'll move on to our third and final presentation, um, which is understanding Tartini and his thought having to do, of course, with translation. And so for that, we move to Janiera Kulun, which I don't know how to pronounce that, my apologies. It's okay, <laughs> thank you. It's Irnea. Um, could you just uh, please tell me if you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Uh, perhaps you'd like to make it full screen. Yes, I'm trying to. Lower right, yes, okay. perfect. Thank you so much. So even though uh, it might seem like a bit of a departure from the main theme of this conference, since I will be talking about language, and I must admit I'm a bit nervous to talk uh, to such distinguished Tartini scholars, but I do believe that a discussion on translation of music-linked text could be quite informative also in this context. I will discuss some difficulties and dilemmas I encountered while working on the Slovene translation of the extensive collection of Tartini's letters, uh, focusing mainly on the correspondence between Tartini and Giovanni Battista Martini. This year, I had the opportunity to work on the recently published trilingual publication of letters and documents in two volumes edited by Giorgio Malago, who's with us uh, this time, um, and translated into English by Roberto Baldo and Hugh Ward Perkins. Uh, 
the publication features 189 documents that are, as we have seen in these two days, an exceptional source of knowledge regarding Tartini's complex musical, theoretical and philosophical thought, and as well as his character. Now, I won't expand on that since I'm not an expert in those fields. I will say, though, that in the months that I spent with Tartini, I came to know him as a devoted teacher, uh, an affectionate friend, a bit of a glutton, as we know, since he can hardly wait for a delivery of cocoa and admits to be very fond of uh, good and healthy chocolate. And at times, even as an irritable and petulant old man, as we can see in the next quote, in which Martini declares he will, uh, Tartini uh, declares he will no longer waste his time with novels and buffoons who criticize his work, possibly referring to the unfortunate critique by Le Serre. I truly believe that the translation of this text is one of the most important means of understanding Tartini's reflection on music theory and a firm basis for further research, especially among those who are not proficient in Italian. It also gives us a chance to study some of the more prominent linguistic feature of the Italian of Settecento, especially in regards to their translation into present day Slovene. So let me start with some general observations. In the case of Tertini's letters, many translation difficulties stem from a lack of context. We're mostly reading a one-sided conversation and cannot always be sure what he's responding to. Um, there are also many unknown extratextual elements. For example, when Tertini mentions figure eight, egualmente si è dimostrato convenire tutti in AB, AB figura ottava come termine comune, but the figure itself is not included in the letter and there is no footnote explaining it, we can only speculate what he is referring to. The second uh, difficulty stems from the use of an archaic vocabulary as well as the semantic shift, which implies that time, at, uh, through, over time, words change in meaning. And for example, even the conjunction, però, is not what it seems. Uh, nowadays, we would use it as an adversative conjunction, meaning but, however, yet. But Tartini still uses it in its archaic meaning, per questo, perciò, so therefore. Obviously, the meaning of the entire period could change if we use one rather than the other. So it's important to recognize these um, nuances of meaning and fortunately enough, there are some online uh, historical dictionaries one can consult and uh, confirm their suspicion. Vocabulario della Crusca being one of them. Moving on, some difficulties certainly arise from the stylistic, syntactic, lexical, and phraseological characteristic of the Italian of Settecento. At the time, Italian was perceived as the language of emotion, poetry, and musicality as opposed to French, which was regarded as the language of uh, clarity and scientific reasoning, um, according to Marazzini. The spoken languages were prevalently dialects, while the written language, which was based on the Tuscan or rather Florentine dialect, was still characterized by syntactic inversions that were influenced by, Latins, uh, by Latin and the literary style of Trecento. Um, but now we can already see a shift towards the natural order of constituents, so subject, verb, odd, object. And it was also um, veined with dialectal forms and idiomatic expressions. The language of science had not yet reached the conciseness it, it, conciseness, uh, it achieved later on. And as Migliorini puts it, Neither it was so detached from the literary language not to allow for some elegance of expression. And just to illustrate this elegance of expression, um, even though this is not a scientific text per se, this is how Tertini introduces his theories in his letter to the mathematician Paolo Battista Balbi, 
in 1741. Condotto a mano della mia fortunata semplicità di pensare, aiutato infinitamente dalla scienza armonica, in cui sinora niun uomo grande si è degnato a internarsi, sebbene in essa solamente vi è la chiave della natura, ho scoperto molti fenomeni e fisiche dimostrazioni dalle quali illuminato e dalla musica portata nella natura fisica universale ho veduto chiaramente la soluzione di tutte quelle difficoltà che sinora sono insolubili appresso i matematici. In fact, all of the characteristics I mentioned can be found in Tretini's writing, which is marked, as we can see from this example, by long and complex periods with several subordinate and embedded clauses. And as Professor Durante and Nate Zuklan uh, pointed out in these days, Re, the, the writings are riddled with references to ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Hermes Trismegistos, um, also ancient mathematicians and musical ther theorists, but also scripture. We see a quote from Matthew 26, 8 in this next quote um, and other texts. We can also observe many Venetian and Eastern Venetian dialectal elements. So, not an easy read from, at all from today's perspective. Uh, Tartini himself uh, declared he purposefully intended to be obscure in his writing where he had some other objective. And when he became frustrated with his long and inconclusive discussion with uh, Martini and Balbi regarding his theories, he wrote, deduco che o il trattato è un fanatismo o il trattato è talmente oscuro che non si può intendere o il trattato non conclude la verità che si propone. In fact, other scholars of his time perceived Tartini's theoretical works as incomprehensible, D'Alembert and Lasser, just to name two. Um, so taking into consideration um, all of the above, how can we transpose it and produce a text that is going to be well received by the present day reader. Borrowing from Claude Paliska, to what in the original text should the translation be faithful? Should we be faithful to the author's terminology by the use of cognates, so words with uh, the same origins or loan words? Uh, should we be faithful to form, to the sentence structure? Um, and to what extent should we emulate the author's writing style? Paliska also provides an answer. A translation will not serve its purpose or hit its mark, if hit its mark unless it's expressed in the language that the translator and the reader share, which includes the technical terminology that is in vogue at their time. So according to Paliska, immediate comprehension should always take precedence. Now, turning our focus uh, to the Tartini-Martini correspondence, I will present some examples from the early letters, which provide a basis for later exchanges regarding Tartini's mathematical approach to music theory, as well as some examples from later exchanges regarding Tartini's treaties on the third tone and the squaring of the circle, the most interesting of things that can be debated among men, as Tartini said. Regarding, regarding Tartini's use of musical terminology, it should be noted that the, mean, uh, that the meaning of the terms tuono and suono depend largely on the context. Suono is not always translatable with the English cognate sound or the Slovene ex equivalent zvok. The use of the term tone is far more advisable when it applies a specific quality as in the case of terzo suono, third tone, or treti tone, which are conventionally used terms in both English and in Slovenian. The second dilemma concerns the name of the keys, as Tretini used names deriving from the hexachord system. So, G sol re ut ala mi re, F fa ut sharp. Should this be changed to G major, A major, F sharp major, or G dur a dur fis dur? in order to uh, accommodate the present day reader and to ensure immediate comprehension or not. Similarly, it was difficult to decide how to proceed with the names of the ratios that define the intervals. Uh, 
the dupla sesqui altera sesqui terza could now, of course, be interpreted as the octave, the fifth, and the third. But 13's discussion focuses precisely on ratios. So it is important to keep this aspect. And he also he often uses uh, the name of the ratio and the interval side by side in the same sentence, as we see here. E da questa divisione nasce la sesqui terza, cioè la quarta. In the English translation, we see the use of cognates again, duple, sesqui alter, sesqui third. In, Slovene, in the Slovene language, we are not so lucky. The use of the loan words um, is not conventional, and we had to opt for a descriptive approach, deriving the Slovene equivalents from the terms of the ratio, so the numbers of the fractions. And I'm saying we, and only mentioning these few examples because they mark the start of a fruitful cooperation with Nate Suklian, who contributed significantly uh, to the definition of the terms in Slovene. Moving on to the mathematical terminology, we have to discuss the terms proporzione and ragione that appear so frequently in Tertini's letters to Martini. In mathematics, the term proporzione, a proportion, means that two ratios or fractions are equal. So A is to B as C is to D. In Slovene, the exact mathematical term is sorasmirie. Ragione or ratio, so a quotient of two numbers or quantities, and defined in the Italian vocabulary trecani as a constant relation between the terms of a progression or sequence, um, in Slovene can be translated to rasmirie. And these Slovene terms, mathematical terms, are not interchangeable in any way. The problem is that in his early correspondence, Tartini uses the two terms proporzione and ragione as synonyms, always meaning ratio and never alluding to the equal value of two ratios. So in Slovene, it would be simply wrong to translate it as proportion, well, proporzione as sorasmeria just to keep two different terms, while the use of the loan word proporzia as a possible synonym uh, for Rasmiria would be stylistic, stylistically questionable, to say the least. Um, in the English translation, we also see the synonymic use of the terms proportion and ratio. Uh, for example, we have um, the sesqui fourth proportion and then duple ratio, sesqui alter ratio. And in the Slovene translation, we can only operate with the term Rasmiria. Um, so, but if we turn to Paliska again regarding the synonymity of proportion and ratio, he observed that Boethius used three different terms for ratio, proportio, habitudo, and comparatio in his work. And he believes that there is no particular advantage to use the three different English equivalents when ratio is the only mathematically exact term, mathematically exact term, sorry. In later Tartini correspondence with Martini, we can observe a divergence in the meaning of ragione and proporzione. Here we see, sicché qualunque data ragione, solitaria e separata da proporzione o serie, sia per sé armonica. Ragione is still used for ratio, while proporzione, if we consult Tartini's theoretical works, seems to be used as a synonym for progression or rather a three-term ratio. In this case, I believe the distinction, the distinction should be at least addressed in a footnote. When explaining his propositions, Tartini relies on geometry. And yet again, we encounter a problem regarding terminology. For example, he uses the terms linea, linea retta uh, quadratrice, linea sonora, to represent the string uh, in a mathematical demonstration. This can, of course, be translated word for word as line, straight line, line and sounding line, or certa, rauna certa, and svenecio certa. But I'm not sure that this translation conveys the true meaning of Tertini's terms. And I'm not sure this use is mathematically sound. Certa is certainly not a mathematical term in Slovene. 
So again, we have to, um, we, we can only uncover the meaning of the term and provide a second inter possible interpre interpretation by consulting Tartini's theoretical works and observe the multiple figures that illustrate his propositions. There we will see that the lines that Tartini is referring to, for example, AB, in fact, have a definite length and two endpoints. Therefore, we can assume he's talking about line segments and translate the term accordingly. So in Slovene, the Lita maybe. But does this depart too much from the original? Tartini himself, uh, Tartini himself admits to the use of common terms in his own way. Inoltre sono a me conscio che alle volte adopro termini formati a modo mio. So does the second interpretation convey a better mathematical knowledge? Which strategy is preferable? Should we keep an ambiguous term to be faithful to the author or aim for immediate understanding? From these examples, it is clear that we cannot approach such texts in isolation. Paratext, that is other material associated with the main text, so the author's other works, scholarly publications and footnote annotations are crucial for an adequate translation. And in our discussions with Nate Suklian, we kept comparing the propositions from Trattini's letters to the propositions in his Trattato di Musica secondo la vera scienza dell'armonia, but could not make any sense of them. In the letters, there were direct, quote, direct quotes that could not be found in the Trattato. And luckily, while consulting a scholar in the field of historical mathematics, Professor Marco Raspet, it has been found that Tertini might actually be referring, as Nate Zuklian uh, told us before, to an earlier, uh, earlier unpublished work, La Quadratura del Circolo. As we can see here from a quote, uh, from the quote from a letter, Non già nel modo comune, ma in modo particolare dedotto dalla scienza fisico-armonica, di cui non si ha cognizione. Quindi lo leggono di nuovo per grazia, senza che io le trascriva. Non già nel modo comune, and so on. And the same phrase can be found in the first paragraph of La Quadratura del Circolo. Non già nel modo comune, ma in modo particolare, che significa molto più, e così, um, and so on. Uh, so we found we found this new reference that helped us understand the terminology. And better yet, we could then consult a thesis by a Slovene mathematician, Vladimir Bensa, who analyzed and attempted to translate Tartini's manuscript. Now, not coincidentally, the missing figure eight I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation is quite possibly the figure I showed you on this slide. It is taken from La Quadratura del Circolo, and according to Bensa, it illustrates Tartini's fifth thesis or proposition, which is directly referenced in the same letter from 1752, è meglio che io stesso spieghi la quinta proposizione. So a text that presents so many linguistic and terminological, terminological difficulties that often lacks a broader con uh, context and contains so many obscure references um, definitely calls for an annotated edition, I think, which unfortunately, in this case, would mean an extensive and thorough uh, research that exceeds my knowledge and my role as a translator. So let me just conclude by saying that not even the process of translation itself can be carried out in isolation, but rather in cooperation with experts in various fields. And while it's virtually impossible to translate such a text without the help of experts, it should be noted that such experts usually lack the necessary translation skills, including the linguistic, cultural, and transfer competencies to perform the task successfully. A translator has to analyze and understand the source and make the appropriate uh, lexical, grammatical, and stylistic choices to convey the message and the overall feeling uh, of the source text in the target language. They also have to achieve the same effect on the target reader as the text had on the source, on the source reader. 
source text reader, sorry. And in doing so, obviously they have to consult experts, especially regarding the field specific lexis terminology, or they might risk producing a translation that is of no use to anyone. So the Slovene translation of Tartini's letters has seen the cooperation of a core team of a translator, a copy editor, my dear colleague Petra Jordan, a musicologist, Nate Suklian, as well as many others from violinists, historians, mathematicians, classical philologists, and others who uh, contributed and helped us out. Now, I'm not claiming that we've achieved a perfect translation or <laughs> perfect harmony, but hopefully this, this joint effort will facilitate further research uh, into Tertini's life and work and promote new and exciting projects in Slovenia and abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much for one of the clearest and most complete uh, exposés I've ever heard about the uh, duties of a translator of technical materials. Um, I, uh, I wondered, um, I mean, my memory is very clear that when I studied the history of um, uh, music theory uh, in graduate school, when we came to Tartini, it was a nightmare. Um, and uh, I, I always thought I could more or less read Italian, <laughs> but a lot of what he had to say didn't made no sense. So I'm happy to hear that others found a difficulty. But I, I wonder, uh, at the time, I just thought, well, clearly my Italian is lousy and I don't know a thing about music theory. Um, whether Tartini, when he says that he is sometimes purposely obscure, isn't being a little defensive and, and making a rationalization about times when language is failing him or why, or why doesn't he just call it um, this, that, that uh, an unsolved uh, conflict of understanding or some, something that indicates that he hasn't quite grasped it and neither have we. Um. Thank you. I think maybe Nate uh, uh, Sokian will help me out with this answer. I think that um, uh, when he says that, he, move, he moves towards the met metaphysical, as Nate Sokian pointed out before. So from the physical, from the theory, he moves to the, um, to the metaphysical and he's trying to hide maybe a message within this theoretical framework. But I'm certainly not an expert. I was just transmitting the message. I was just uh, trying to relay the same message in Slovenian. So maybe someone else could um, answer your question better. But I think that was quite a, quite a good answer um, and bears out some other things that have been said about Tartini as well. So. Uh, yes, I, I would like to hear what others have to say, but I, before that, I, I want to raise the question of cognates. Um, and you posed it as whether they should or should not be used. And then you went uh, to um, a fairly long discourse indicating to me that they should not be used or they should not be used at the beginning of work um, because it's uh, what the French calls fausse um, mm -hmm. That is cognates seldom mean precisely the same thing in both languages. Um, and is it perhaps uh, different uh, in borrowed languages, uh, you know, non-spoken languages like Latin, but even, even there. Um, I, I think always one must um, write out what you think it means avoiding the cognate and then put the cognate in parentheses. Now that's not the final version. That's the version to find out whether you actually <laughs> understood the word. Yes, and maybe if you only use cognates, the target text will be just as cryptic 
as the source text was in this case. Yes. And in Slovene, we don't have the luxury to use only cognates because the languages differ and we have we don't uh, have the same <laughs> origins, right? Right. right. So but that may, that to, might be a benefit. Sorry. That might be an, a frustrating benefit of your language, which Maybe. is that you, yeah. you are forced to commit uh, uh, to to something. Yes. Um, others, questions and comments. Yes, Roberta. Yeah, many thanks for this very interesting presentation. Um, mm, my impression is that uh, this is quite a um, difficult matter here because it is uh, in between, so just uh, between history of uh, terminology and terminology management. Um, because what are you describing here is multilingual uh, terminology management and then you have to see if you, in your language you have the concept of if you have the denomination etc so classical problems so one practical question of mine is uh, are you using uh, computer assisted uh, terminology management software yes yes which one i was well i was translating with uh, memoq which uh, in which you can create a term base. So this might prove really useful and um, in future projects maybe to create a terminology or a glossary of Tartini's uh, mm -hmm. theoretical works. Because myself, I'm using uh, SDL uh, multi-term mm -hmm. And, and then I try to combine this with the classical German Begriffsgeschichte because we have one expert here at the German Institute, this uh, Dr. Sabine Elmer-Erfund. But there is quite a skeptical attitude just combining the historical terminology with this uh, systematical terminology management. But here, as you show us, uh, we have to deal with uh, both issues, actually. Thank you. Yes, others. the uh, question of to what extent one can or should convey the original style, tone uh, of, the, uh, the, of the original language in the translation. Um, I'm sympathetic to P Poliska's idea, which you cited that the main thing is comprehension but that's a scholar's view, yeah. uh, which, as you said, could be mitigated by footnotes, which make things complicated and harder and, and longer and more expensive. <laughs> um, but if one were really to publish an anthology of Tartini, let's say in English, that you were hoping would be used as a, a general reference and textbook uh, for English readers, um, the comprehension uh, might be the most important thing. Whereas for scholars, uh, I think the nuances are terribly important as you, as you indicated. Well, as far as style, um, I have to say that, well, you cannot translate into the Slovene of the <laughs> 18th century. It would be unreadable from today's standards. So we tr I try to um, make the text readable, but maybe color it with some more archaic Slovene words and even the idiomatic uh, forms of um, introductions or um, the, the, the greetings, um, which I, I, try to, I try to keep those to give a sense of this style. Yes, yes. So so every once in a while you put on your powdered wig just to remind people. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. yes. Anybody else? Roberto again. Maybe only a short question. Um, do you have the impression that uh, Tratini's terminology is generally consistent? Well, as I have mentioned before, it changed from the early letters to the later correspondence. Um, in the case of 
proporzione e ragione. Mm. So, um, maybe we should do a study on that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not ready to anything, but yes, maybe in some cases it's not consistent. And that was also a problem when deciding how to translate a term, because later on um, it means something else. It was also the case of estremo and, uh, and other terms used in his letters. So also termine. Termine has many meanings and you have to then decide <laughs> and discover in which meaning he meant, which, uh, what he meant by it. So. Because you may face the problem of style, so early style, that style, and then you try to do it quite in a plastic language, so to say. Uh, but um, the other matter would be, so as a movie theorist, I would say it's the, the, the system as a language system also consistent. Or if we found different musical concepts as an example, a mathematical concept just as a not si systematically uh, explained, but uh, with some gaps or with some or different or varied use of the same term. So consistency in this sense. If, if I, I, apologies for interrupting, but I <coughs> should uh, uh, have a long conversation off uh, off Zoom at some time soon because these are important technical matters. And I see that we're 12 minutes behind schedule and therefore it is my duty to thank everyone and especially our three speakers for stimulating presentations. And um, we seem to be moving on to final remarks and a break. Yes, thank you very much. Um... For all the speakers in this session. Um, we are at the end practically of our conference. So I would like to thank to all the speakers uh, and ask you for any closing remarks if you have them or, or if you would like to share some thoughts, ideas. Um, we can also say something at the end of the next um, event, which is scheduled in about 15 minutes, so after the presentation of the letters. But if you want to say something now, as we are at the end of presentations, please. I'd like to make a request from Ithaca, which is in upstate New York and roughly equidistant between Toronto and New York City. Um, I seem to be the only person in North America who actually knows that these texts are available. I wonder if there could be some public announcement of those parts of the research that are now available to, the, to everyone online. Have I missed such an announcement? Or was it in Slovenian? Uh, okay, I think Sergio Durante has just answered you. Uh, in chat, IMS newsletter, he said. Ah, okay. Oh. Now the subscription to the IMS newsletter is minuscule. Um, Okay, is this where? Uh -huh. True, but yet. <laughs> <laughs> How about in the newsletters of the various learned societies that are interested in this? Other than just the IMS. Okay, thank you for this yeah. uh, idea. Okay, any other comments? Ideas, questions. Okay, so if not, um, we can conclude this.
part of the conference and um, reconvene again in about 15 minutes, so at four o'clock for the last uh, event of this conference. So.